down as we build our program even further. Back to you, Mark. Thank you, Bill. Or, uh, sorry, thank you, Bill and Stuart. <laughs> thank you, Stuart. Um, I would like to, to add a little bit uh, more into just the intro um, regarding startup efforts and how Food Co-op 500 came to be. In the last 10 years, we've had more inquiries from people in communities who want to have a food co-op. And um, so NCGA and NCB and uh, CDS uh, have, have come together to, to help the Food Co-op 500 um, have a vision for more and more food co-ops successfully serving our members. Um, there's tremendous resources available and we encourage you to uh, take advantage of that. Um, I would like to um, uh, help you see how to interact with Bill and uh, the guests today. We're going to be using the GoToWebinar um, uh, toolbar. Uh, if it's not expanded on your computer, you would use the uh, hit the little triangle next to the word question and then type into enter a question for the staff and hit send. Um, Stuart is going to be managing uh, your questions and comments. We do highly encourage you to um, exercise your fingers and send those in. Um, the session today is being recorded. The recording will be available on the uh, main um, uh, registration page for the webinar series. We, uh, we encourage you to take advantage of the recording and, and download that. It should be available um, later today. At the end of the session, there's an evaluation. We uh, hope that you'll take a few minutes and fill that out. Your feedback um, is uh, highly valued by us uh, as we continue to improve the series. And the last comment is that um, uh, on September 17th, the next webinar is Skills and Tools for the Organizing Stage, presented by Stuart. Uh, same time, same channel. Uh, the key to getting connected is registering, and then you will get the same kind of contact info uh, delivered to you. Um, so, now I'd like to introduce uh, Bill Gessner. Bill has been very involved in expansions and startup efforts for more than 20 years. He represents a wealth of knowledge and experience in that area, and we're pleased to have him with us today. So, uh, Bill, take it away. Thank you, Mark, and uh, welcome, everybody. I'm glad you're able to be with us uh, for this next hour and a half. Um, I do, uh, have been doing consulting work with food co-ops. Uh, this is my first year. And the primary work that I've done over that time is working with existing and established food co-ops and assisting them in the planning and implementation of expansion or relocation or new store projects. And uh, during the time, and most, in, and especially in the last five years, I've been working increasingly with startup efforts uh, around the country. And um, as Mark and Stuart have alluded to, we've certainly seen a, a a strong growing interest in startup efforts and uh, that have kind of spontaneously germinating around the country. And so we're working to provide support uh, to all those startup efforts and and uh, through things like these webinars, uh, we're hopefully hoping we can bring people together and um, do learning opportunities and make it an easier process. Mark, I'm getting a little bit of background feedback here. Yeah, there is there is a slight echo. Um, apologies for that. It happened um, kind of at the end of our of our um, getting ready stage. So um, I'm not sure. You know, Ben, it might have been your phone, but I don't remember when you when you started in. I I didn't I didn't pick it up. So I'm not really sure. It'd be a is it is it tolerable for you, Bill? It, it's not coming in. Um, uh, it's it's not too bad, I think, for the listeners. So, how is it for you? It's okay for me. Okay. I, no, I'm not hearing it. In fact, that was better. Whatever just happened. So, uh, thank thanks for whoever tried something. <laughs> Go ahead, Bill. Okay. Um, so we have a an agenda, kind of roughly s scheduled here for today, and and showing that for the uh, first. Um, 35 or 40 minutes, I kind of want to walk through and do a bit of an overview of the development model that has been 
um, developed and it's featured on the Food Co-op 500 website, uh, that model being the four cornerstones in three stages. And uh, we will, during that uh, time, we'll uh, ask Stuart to interject uh, a few questions that are relevant, but I want to get to a point where um, by a quarter to the hour, we're opening it up uh, more broadly to questions and discussion. And then um, once we move into um, the top of the hour, and then we'll we'll hopefully have that last half hour be uh, again for questions and discussion. Um, and then to take a little bit of time at the very end for some uh, conclusion and, and evaluation. So that is the, the basic plan. Uh, the objectives today, the learning objectives, are that uh, the participants will gain a greater understanding of the Food Co-op 500 development model and that they understand how the four cornerstones can be developed through the startup process and thirdly understand the importance and the sequence and the roadmap uh, that is offered by the three stages. Uh, the, the task that all of your groups are in the midst of is a very challenging uh, uh, task and it's, it's complex and it's probably much more difficult to open a food co-op than it was um, 30 years ago when, when a great number of food co-ops and natural food co-ops um, were born and, and you know, out of those uh, there are about 300 that have survived uh, and we're certainly hoping that this new wave, a new generation of co-ops will, will add significantly to that number, but it is a, it's a challenging process. And so we're, we're hopeful that this development model can provide guidance and, and a roadmap of sorts for you. So that's the, the primary aim today. Uh, the visual for the four cornerstones in three stages is shown here. Um, where you see the four cornerstones, vision, talent, capital, and systems, and that they function at the base and kind of anchoring those cornerstones, and then the stages moving from left to right, organizing stage one, stage two, a feasibility and planning stage, and stage three, implementation. Uh, an overview article explaining this more completely can be found on the link, site, link uh, that is shown there. And um, so at a later time, if you want to download and look, look at that link, you can, you can do that. The um, creating a cooperative business, uh, very simplistically stated, is uh, creating a business and creating a cooperative. And so if you begin to look at your task as a developmental effort, what are you trying to create, what are you trying to develop, and you are in the midst of that in your organization, but to have some awareness of the, of the developmental process and to be looking that you're trying to create something that is both strong as a business and strong as a cooperative organization. So the um, and then ultimately there's not much you don't really see the distinction in, in the end product you achieve a seamless balance between the business and the cooperative so certainly in the early generations of the nat early days of the natural food co-ops uh, there wasn't much emphasis on the business and there was a lot of emphasis on the the idealism, uh, the specific mission of the of the co-op, uh, but you know, those co-ops that weren't paying attention to business and weren't um, profitable soon found that they could not, you know, fulfill their mission of being a, a, a cooperative in their community or fulfill the ideals of of you know, trying to aim at whatever their particular mission was. So. Um, that as you're developing your cooperative to, to keep in mind that there are these two aspects. 
so again, the development continuum. Uh, you can you can imagine a, a continuum with um, at one end of a continuum. So this is really in any group that comes together to try to do something. There are people in the group that are very task oriented, very goal oriented, very focused on the end outcome. And then there are those in the group that are very much um, process oriented or, or maintenance oriented. They're wanting to make sure everybody gets along during the, the time that they're working together. They're probably not as focused on the end goal. And so a group coming together to work together effectively combines both of these um, orientations. And you know, where might you plot yourself on this continuum uh, in terms of your own style and approach? Are you at the task oriented end on the left or you know, or are you on the right and more of a maintenance oriented person? You know, where would you plot yourself? Or are you in the middle, a combination of both, and your group as a whole. How would you characterize your group? Are you predominantly tilted towards task-oriented, or are you overly tilted towards being maintenance-oriented? So, developing leadership skills and capacity at both ends and in the middle of that continuum. So the beginning to just take a quick look at the going through the cornerstones and I'm assuming that people have some familiarity with the model and I, I'm not going to go through all of the slides in detail um, but here again that if you're to create a cooperative business four primary ingredients that you want to bring to that creation and build throughout the whole time of the business are these cornerstones and the vision cornerstone being the articulation of the hopes and dreams of the founding group that this vision is both broad and long-term inspiring and also very specific and local what is what do you see your food co-op looking like a year from now Two years from now, um, five years from now, um, and you know, can you, as a group, work to build that vision so that you have a shared vision? Uh, each of you, each of the people in your founding team or steering committee or on your board of directors might have their own individual vision of what your co-op might look like five years or ten years from now. And but how much of those individual visions are a shared vision? Uh, would as much as 20% of those individual visions be shared, or would it be more like 80% of those individual visions be a shared vision? So that's a process of working, perhaps from a 20% level to shared to you know to at least 80%. Um, So, you know, that, that vision is the, is the first cornerstone that we're taking a look at here. The second one being the talent, cornerstone of talent, is you're assembling a group of people to work together, uh, basically being the leadership, the initial leadership group of your co-op, and you're trying to build a shared vision. Um, so probably somebody initially that will be kind of champion, being the champion. Uh, um, and that person may continue being the champion or somebody else may, might emerge. Uh, there's also kind of this initial group, a steering committee or a task force or a founding team. And then as the co-op incorporates, there's a board of directors. There are usually some developers involved uh, in perhaps in a consulting capacity, usually external to the co-op, and then management um, in terms of project management and general management and staff. So building a talent pool and you can't uh, you can't go you can't have too much talent. 
and uh, certainly the quality and skills of the people that you have and their ability to work, communicate, uh, and to work together effectively is key and critical. So the third cornerstone being capital, uh, so adding to the vision and to the talent, then there's the capital. What are the financial resources necessary to get through all the stages of development? Uh, the um, capital is, is typically viewed as either uh, equity within the organization, it comes generated internally, or it comes from outside the organization, which is debt. The uh, so the uh, formation of capital is bringing together internal resources, and in that those internal resources from the members are used to leverage the external resources, um, and that there's the members of food co-op have a responsibility to help capitalize the co-op. The fourth cornerstone. Uh, being systems uh, added to vision, talent, capital, and systems. And so systems is probably the hardest cornerstone to really get your hands around, but if you look at all aspects of the organization, all aspects of the business, they really, they really are systems that are developed to make the operation, to make the cooperative sustainable. And so systems can be looked at in a variety of ways. Uh, these are the organized, integrated, coordinated, interdependent methods. There are legal systems. There's governing system, management, and human resources. And the list that, that is shown here. Um, there's operational systems, and you could all make a whole list of 10 or 20 or 500 operating systems that will eventually be developed, you know, once your store is open. Um, in, in systems development, it is important to have an idea of a commitment to continuous improvement so that the early systems that you develop, even like your bookkeeping systems, um, your planning systems, your communication systems, your membership system, uh, you begin to develop these systems in the, in the very early stages in the organizing stage. Um, but there should be, you should also be developing a commitment to continuously improving those systems as the organization grows and develops. And that as the organization grows and develops, the systems become more complex. And so you're building your capacity as an organization to develop and maintain and improve systems. So that is just a quick walk through the, three, the four cornerstones. And going back to our, again, our visual aid that you see here at the top, four cornerstones surrounding the three stages, and we'll take a quick look at those stages. Stage one being the organizing stage, stage two, the feasibility and planning stage, and stage three, uh, implementation stage. Both stage two and stage three have what we would call sub-stages or So there's stage 2A and 2B. So stage, so you can see that each, as we go from stage one to stage two, uh, it gets a little more complex because there are sub-stages. Then we go to stage three, and then there are there are four sub-stages there. So that's even more complex. The the idea of identifying what stage your organization is in, I think, is extremely important. And you might tend to say, well, we're, we're doing some things that are in the organizing stage, and we're doing some things that are in the feasibility stage, and we're somewhere in between those stages. And what I recommend is, as you learn this model and get 
comfortable with the distinction that you clearly identify where you are at in these three stages, including in the sub-stages. Uh, so that at any one time you could say, well, we now are in stage 2A, we moved into that two months ago after we completed our organizing stage, our organizing stage lasted, you know, nine months or a year and a half. Uh, we completed everything that we aim to do in the organizing stage except for two, two items that we carried forward into the feasibility stage, in stage 2A, and they're on our list of things to deal with in 2A so that we make sure that we don't forget about those. So some type of kind of systematic approach to moving through this, I think, is what you ultimately want to be able to do. The dotted line that you see between stage 2B and stage 3 and the solid line between stage 3A and 3B are very important to understand from a development and roadmap perspective that the dotted line signifies the end of stage 2B, which would be the point where you would secure a site, either through lease or purchase, uh, that has contingencies. So that you would secure a site contingent upon getting all of your financing in place. And so that you secure the site so that no one else can get it for a period of time, and then you go to work and try to get all of your financing in place along with all of your design work and pre-construction planning work in stage 3A, and then those all come together and you make a your final decision at the end of stage 3A where you close on your financing, you close on your agreement with the contractors, and once you go over stage 3A, there's really no turning back. Up until that point, there are a series of decision points as you progress through stage 1. There might be three or four kind of major decision points. Are you going to keep going and what is what are you aiming for? Uh, do you have enough members to warrant going forward? Uh, and making decisions about are you going to invest in hiring outside professional services to help you assist feasibility work, but those type of decisions that happen in stage two, a uh, series of decision points. All of these kind of culminating with the decision point represented by the dotted line uh, that you secure with a lease agreement or a purchase agreement a site, but it's contingent so that you it's not your final decision point. This is a very, in many ways, it's a very simple concept, but I find that most groups <clears throat> don't have an understanding of this. <clears throat> and without that understanding, they're, they're, they will get, they'll attempt to move forward, but find themselves getting trapped and not being prepared and not being well positioned to make this final decision. It comes after 3A. So we'll illustrate this. <clears throat> we'll illustrate. I'll attempt to illustrate this by some of the additional slides here. The um, so the organizing stage, um, where you're trying to say, or you're going to create an organization um, after one or more people have started with an idea, recognizing a common problem. Uh, this includes some of the major things: convening a core group assessing common interests, designating support, building a shared vision, committing time and money, and possibly doing some very preliminary feasibility assessment work so that you can gain a sense, is what your dream, is it, is there some basis, or is it potentially feasible? Um, and this is, I say that this can be informal at this point uh, because you would be doing if the answer is yes, then you would probably move on to the next stage where you would do the more formal feasibility work. Uh, sometime during stage one, and we generally recommend as early as possible, you would incorporate 
uh, becoming a legal entity, and that so that by the end of stage one, the organization has been formed uh, both legally and with some substance uh, that perhaps you have so many members uh, already by the end of stage one that you have a functioning board of directors, that you have work groups uh, set up, um, that you have raised some initial resources, financial resources. So there's kind of a checklist that each group can develop that would define what they need to do during the organizing stage and what would signify completion of that. Stage 2 combines stage 2A and 2B. 2A is feasibility, 2B the planning work. Um, the organizing the organized group uh, is building their commitment and their capacity during this time. You're beginning to assess feasibility in four key areas. Uh, and, and a lot of groups are, I think, a little bit confused about what is involved in assessing feasibility, and they think that there is one kind of feasibility, that somebody is going to come in and do one feasibility study and proclaim that you're co-op is feasible. Uh, I suggest that there are really four components to assessing feasibility, uh, market potential or market feasibility, uh, financial feasibility, internal readiness or organizational capacity, and then fourthly, design feasibility. And that, for example, something might be, there might be a market analysis done showing that you have, your co-op has the potential to have X number of dollars of sales at this particular location and size of location. But that doesn't say anything about whether the project is financially feasible. So it could be feasible from a market analysis and a market feasibility point of view. But when you run out the numbers from a financial performance, profitability, and ability to service the debt, it finds that it's, it might not be financially feasible. And so at least it, in many of the groups we're working with, the initial look at things financially, if you take a realistic look at it, it, it can be very challenging to be feasible financially. So you have to work through um, those financial projections, financial performance, modifying the assumptions, and basically doing financial planning so that you can have something that can be viable. Uh, financially. Thirdly, from an internal readiness point of view, um, you know, is there an emerging organization um, that has talent and the ability to work together and the beginnings of systems and policies that demonstrate capacity? Uh, will the organization be able to hire? a project manager or a general manager and hold that person accountable. Uh, that is a big test. And from the design feasibility point of view, at least in the feasibility stage, you want to do some, once you have located a preferred site, you want to do some preliminary design work to see is it really feasible to have a grocery store in this site, uh, both from, from the basic structural conditions of the building to environmental issues, to uh, receiving and delivery capacity, uh, uh, you, adequate utilities. Uh, so those are some of the basic things that are looked at in design feasibility. In addition to saying, can you lay out a store that would meet the needs of what your vision is in this particular site? So doing some preliminary store planning, store layout work. So stage two, feasibility, the deeper assessments of, of feasibility. Stage two, B, planning. Once if it's shown to be feasible, then beginning to put together a business plan that, that can be to guide the organization and to help secure financing. And this process 
going through this builds commitment and builds capacity in the organization. And at the end of stage two, you have negotiated, identified and negotiated an agreement to secure a site. Stage three is the implementation. Um, you've, you've built capacity in all four of the cornerstones in the vision, talent, and capital, and systems. You work through the four different sub-stages of stage three, the pre-construction being the stage that leads up to the final decision point between stage 3A and 3B. Pre-construction, the two main tracks of that are the design work. Once, you, once you've secured a site, you would then engage an architect more completely to do design work and planning work for the site. And concurrently, you would, for example, launch a member loan drive that has been planned, the member loan drive was probably planned back in the planning stage in stage two, but then once you secure the site, you launch your member loan drive and you're, you have enough members at this point to conduct a member loan drive. And then you also get all your financing commitments in place from outside lenders. And then moving into the construction and renovation phase, stage 3B, once the Construction is done, you prepare and set the store for opening. And then, of course, most importantly, you're open for business. And that's when the real work begins. As hard as it has been to get through stage one, two, and three up till 3D, but then can you work, get through the first year and beyond? So that's an outline of the roadmap. Uh, the important ingredient of building commitment along the way, you know, how much time is involved in doing this work, how much money, what level of risk. So your goal is to be building commitment and a level of comfort amongst your growing group of stakeholders who have invested money in your in your in the cooperative. Decision points to have some awareness of the different decision points as you first convene as a group, uh, you have not made any final decision to open a store, um, but eventually you will work up to the final decision point where you commit to opening a particular store at a particular site. So, you know, identifying what the key decision points are, and it's kind of like working your way up a up a ladder, the different steps uh, in a ladder, and then looking, identifying in your particular unique project, imposing that on the three-stage timeline that we just walked through and said, what are your, what and when are your key decision points? So again, looking at the three stages that we just walked through, understanding what the dotted line represents and what the solid line represents. And from a time range point of view, we're seeing that it is taking groups, you know, two to three years to work through these three stages. Some groups don't make it. Uh, some groups don't make it beyond the first stage. Some groups take longer than three years to work through these stages. Uh, I think it's, I think a, a timeline of a year and a half to three years is a reasonable timeline. Uh, it would mean a lot of work. It would mean moving through, you know, maintaining your, building your commitment level through those three years, or year and a half to three years, and sustaining your effort, and having fun, and having a meaningful experience with the people you're working with, so that you're gaining satisfaction personally from the process, that it can be a rewarding process, but it is, there's a lot of work involved.
So this slide shows some of what might be the key decision points for ending each stage. You know, the organization is formed with X number of members with an assessment of very positive, you know, preliminary feasibility, but positive. Stage 2A could end with market and financial feasibility being positive, organizational readiness is positive with X number of members. Stage 2B, the site is secured with contingencies, and once it's secured, it is made public, and you have how many members at this point. Stage 3, all financing in place, tied to finalized construction and renovation contracts. You have X number of members, contingencies are removed, final no turning back decision point. Construction 98% complete, and preparing for opening, construction finalized, all equipment, staff, inventory in place. You have X number of members prior to opening. So again, looking at the three stages and seeing how your co-op project can fit within that. Some possible thresholds for member thresholds by the end of each stage. Um, this is assuming a total store size of 6,000 square feet. And again, these numbers aren't carved in stone, but I think if you were to vary, vary from them, you would want to vary upwards <laughs> and have even more numbers members than what are shown here. Uh, organizing stage, they have 300 members before you declare yourself moving into the formally into the feasibility and planning stage. Uh, by the time you make the final decision, no turning back decision, having 800 members, having 1,000 members by opening. So, when do you hire? Uh, these are key dis decisions. Hiring a project manager and a general manager are key decision points. Uh, wanting to be able to hire a project manager as soon as possible to help you through the early stages. Hiring a general manager six to 12 months before opening. Making good hires is extremely important and valuable, and it can be very costly to, org to an organization to make a, a poor hire or even a mediocre hire. So paying attention to that. Project manager, we sometimes use the term of a development project manager and a facilities project manager. It has more to do with the, the focus of that person's task. And each co-op will be different in terms of what they need for project manager. Maybe there's some people within the steering committee that are effectively managing the project in all areas except related to the site negotiation. So you might need to hire a project manager to help with that, and that person might become the facilities project manager. Uh, but looking at what are your organization's needs to hire, when can you get the resources in place that you will commit to hiring a project manager or a general manager? basically saying looking at hiring a, a project manager, a development project manager to help your help build your membership base and build your organization as soon as possible. Hiring a facilities project manager in stage 2B or stage 3A and a general manager at least by stage 3A if not back in stage 2B. Again, commitment is important. How much time, how much money, how much risk. So these these slides here, I don't want to take too much time and go through. I want to start having some questions. Um, and we'll come back to some of these if, if we have time. So Stuart? Or yes. Um, I just my somehow my internet connection was just lost, but I have a couple of questions already on the queue, and so if anybody has new ones, feel free to continue sending them. Hopefully, I'll be able to recover those fairly quickly. 
Um, first question for you. Uh, how do you secure 300 members during organizing when you haven't even entered into the formal feasibility stage? That's a, that's a very good question. <laughs> uh, let's see if we can go back here to... Um, Um, the the idea that you need commitment from your members saying yes we want to join the co-op uh, to help explore the whether this is going to be feasible or not whether a co-op in our in our community will be feasible or not and we need a, a, an initial show of support from X number of members, let's say 300 people, to see, make sure that we have a base so that we can go forward. And recognizing that if if we don't go, if we don't open the store, you know, perhaps your member equity money might be lost. So then people might say, uh, "Well, I'll wait till you open the store." And then you could say to them, well, I guess we won't be opening the store. So educating your potential members of the importance of their coming on board as owners of the co-op to help you and, and provide support as you work through the process of the three-stage process. Uh, if you can do some very quick and dirty preliminary feasibility work and say that you know there are 300 food co-ops in the country and they are in communities ranging from this size to this size and our community fits within typical demographic profile and if we can get you know a thousand members you know and and if we can pass some tests of market feasibility and financial feasibility that there's a good chance that we can demonstrate feasibility. But some of that initial informal work you can do, and I've seen a number of groups kind of sketch out very uh, preliminary numbers using some very rough demographic data. And, you know, and we can help you with that. And, uh, you know, it may be an initial phone conversation of a, half hour, an hour can give you some guidelines on how you can even do your own initial informal feasibility study. Okay. Uh, here's a real um, quick one for you. What is the cost of a membership? Yeah. Well, in the organizing stage, you will need to begin to look at this and say what what are the capital needs of the organization and how much of the capital do we are going to need you know long term do we want to get from our members so there that's probably the best way to to look at it but it's very difficult to kind of do a a calculation on that when you don't have much experience with that so a lot of groups then revert to what do you think we can get away with and I don't necessarily recommend that. I think there are some, again, quick and dirty calculations that can be done, saying that if you have a store of X number of square feet, uh, 6,000 square feet, then you might have uh, 4,000 square feet of retail, and eventually at maturity you might have 3,000 members, and if 3,000 members uh, contributed X number of dollars, let's say $200 for a membership share, you know what? What would that contribute to the total capital needs of the organization for a store that size? And so, a 6,000 square foot store, 4,000 square feet of retail could be projected to be doing so much sales at maturity, and could have a certain asset size. And if you want your member equity to be a certain percentage of that, then you can calculate that. So that there's it's somewhat of a complex formula, but again, probably with an hour's worth of work on the telephone, we can work that help you work through that specific to your community and your your demographics. 
but I think costs are generally setting the member equity share these days in the 200 250 300 dollar range there is an option of I think of having an annual equity payment uh, we encourage groups never even if you grow to the one-time member equity payment to recognize that at some point in the future the members may choose to raise that requirement so never use the terminology lifetime membership but most groups have most co-ops have a one-time member equity payment but I think there's also the alternative of having an annual equity payment and so without a cap so those are some options Would you recommend segmenting your membership into producers, customers, and surveying them as a beginning point for feasibility? Um, I want to, uh, in a, after this question, Stuart, I want to go back and uh, ask Amanda and, and Dan a couple things on these previous questions. Sure. Um, but in terms of, I think you can do some initial surveying work, uh, even pretty simple survey work to help this determine your your feasibility uh, you can survey consumers you can survey some local producers um, and this might help demonstrate interest and also the surveys are very good marketing tools to, to promote the idea of the co-op so yeah, I think they are. They can be a piece of trying to assess market feasibility, but your primary piece is going to be, you know, a professional market analysis analysis done by a, an analyst who's experienced in the natural food or the grocery industry. Did I answer that one? Do you think? We'll see if we get a follow-up question. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to uh, ask Amanda. Uh, to comment a little about Amanda, uh, Amanda Zug Moore is with the Millions Food Co-op, and Amanda, if you could just uh, tell us a little bit about what does it take to be a member at your co-op, and um, how many members do you have at this point, and what stage are you in in you know in stage two, stage one, stage two, you know, if you could just give us a little description of that, and then I'll ask the same of Ben. Uh, sure. Um, we currently have, I don't know exactly, but I think it's about 470 members. And uh, that is coming from having about 50 at the beginning of the year. So uh, the co-op has been growing tremendously over the course of this year. Um, we ask for a $100 investment from our founding members. There's an option to join for $20 if you are a low-income person, and uh, that's not that's not something that we are saying. You know, if you make less than $20,000 a year, you can join at that level. It's a personal choice for people. If they feel that they can't afford to join at the higher level, they can join at the lower level. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, and, and where, what stage would you say you're? I would say that we we are in 2A. Um, we had had a site, which, as you know, has now uh, fallen through. And having that site, I think, was a great help to us in our ability to uh, get membership, get people to join. And now that that has fallen through, we're uh, kind of, Trying to figure out how to how to move forward right now, um, but we have our market study. We've been working on our financial feasibility, and uh, and we've even done you know preliminary store planning. But that was based on the on the space that we no longer have. Yeah. Although I think it's still useful in terms of knowing the cost of equipment and other things that we'll need. And one of the choices your group made uh, for you know possibly good reasons was to be public about the uh, the site that you're looking at and pursuing uh, even before you had secured the site and I mean I was certainly nervous about that and there are risks of doing that because 
you know, the site can fall through, as, as this one did or has, at least for the time being. Um, and I think the general practice is not to be site specific uh, until you have secured your site, so which would be at the end of stage 2B. So again, that puts it, uh, even an additional challenge out to get members, but I believe, I strongly believe you can get members to sign on to being members of your co-op without knowing a specific site. Uh, you might say we're searching for a site within the following areas, and these are some of the criteria we're looking for. Uh, you, you might say that, and that that can be useful as you're trying to gain members. That's what we're saying now. Yeah. So. Um, can I add something about the, the surveying question? Yes. As the as the I'm the the chair of the feasibility committee at the New Orleans Food Co-op, and uh, we often find that we need professional expertise in in different areas. And I think a really useful thing to survey of your membership is uh, what people's talents and skills and professions are. Uh, it really is helpful to know who your lawyers are who your real estate agents are, who the people that will be able to help so that you don't have to necessarily pay to have things done every time you have a question about something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a very good addition. Thank you. Uh, ben, could you um, kind of walk through a little bit and comment on those three items for your co-op? Where are you located? Um, we're in Harrisonburg, Virginia and our co-op called Friendly City Food Co-op. We are, uh, by the way, I think I'm the source of the feedback. I apologize. Um, we're, we have just gone over 400 members just in the last week or two um, that actually represent about 420 shares sold altogether because uh, some members have chosen to buy multiple shares, but we're keeping separate count of those two things. Our share price is $200, and we don't have any. Uh, we do take payments, uh, so people can make payments over time if they want to, but we don't have a reduced price option. We do accept credit card payment via PayPal also, which has helped a lot of people out. Um, and we're probably in 2, well, no, we're definitely in 2B. Um, we have our market. Uh, study done. We have what we believe is about the best pro forma that we're going to be able to get, and it's good. Um, and we have identified a site, no, uh, negotiated on it. We have agreed on a price with the landlord and are in the process of putting together a uh, lease that includes a 120-day contingency period, which the landlord has tentatively agreed to that fairly long period, um, where we're still, uh, well, we also are, I guess, in the hopefully in the final stage of, of polishing the business plan and our member loan drive paperwork, but uh, we don't have the member loan drive formally started yet, which is a concern um, and is part of why we have not actually tried to sign the lease yet. Or get the lease going faster. Um, are those the all the questions? Yeah, and, and as I as I recall, you you have not publicly announced your site. Is that correct? We haven't, but given like you, like you mentioned before, we mentioned some parameters that it's downtown and has good parking, and uh, it, it in our downtown that it's not hard to narrow it down pretty quickly. So a lot of people do seem to know at this point, uh, but we're still not officially saying where the site is until we actually get it signed. Yeah, good. Um, there, there, will, there will always will be rumors, and you have to determine how you'll respond to those comments, yeah. questions, and rumors, but uh, I strongly encourage you to not, you know, to, to keep that information confidential until you, uh, until you secure the site. It, it's very tempting to say where it is, uh, and we did before we even really started working with CDS, we, we had our eye on a site and we talked about the site. We even had an architect do a drawing of what it could look like. And of course, that site's not even on the table anymore. So we kind of learned through that that 
you know, best not to get people's expectations up over something like that because they do really get excited over it and get real disappointed when you say, well, it's not there anymore. And it it it, it just there's too many things that it affects in terms of uh, it, you lose some control over the negotiating process and you lose some leverage as well. Sure. Uh, so, Stuart, any other questions? We do have a couple more. Um, I'd like to go to uh, kind of a broad one. The uh, this particular store uh, or co-op that we're organizing has a very wide range of economic standing in the community. Trying to find a shared vision and interpreting that in their co-op structure is their current challenge. Do they, should they offer members a chance to work to lower their grocery prices is only one of the issues that are involved. And so, I guess uh, what I'm hearing is that what do you, how do you work in a situation like that, and how do you is it specifically the question of having member member labor? Yeah, I think the the idea of building a shared vision in a in a community that has a disparate population demographics, and whether offering that option may help address some of that concern, or if it's a good idea in general. Mm -hmm. Well, building a shared vision in a in a community with divergent uh, vision, so to speak, is, is can be a challenge. But I think it's really important that at the leadership level of a co-op that they get clear on what the shared vision is at the leadership level, and then go out and begin to test that shared vision with the members of the co-op and with the potential members of the co-op. And if and in, in testing that, I think it's important for the leadership of the co-op, namely the board or the board and the steering committee, to to show, you know, why they why they have arrived at this vision. And it, it should be mentioned that the initial vision that you come up with to open a food co-op and and what you actually end up with might be very different, and that that can be okay because as you go through this process, you learn. You gain more information about what, number one, what your members want and what is feasible uh, from a market point of view and from a financial point of view. And you may then adjust and modify your vision. And so if you're looking specifically at the idea of member labor as a way to modify your vision, um, you know, and then looking at how other food co-ops are dealing with that question and trying to learn from that would be a good study project. Uh, generally, food co-ops have moved away from volunteer labor, especially volunteer labor um, on the retail floor and volunteer labor in the store itself. There are some types of community type of community outreach projects where it is more, where there are more co-ops that have that. Uh, there are some co-ops that have continued and placed a high value on their their volunteer labor. Uh, the, the, the volunteer working member working labor working member program is not that is not a, that value is not necessarily that is not a, one of the seven co-op principles, but it it has been important to some of the existing food co-ops. Uh, there are a lot of legal issues to be looked at in terms of whether uh, your co-op wants to have a working member program. And I would strongly recommend that you look very carefully at those legal issues. And I don't, I, it would take too much to go into that at this time, but if people have questions about that, I'd be glad to communicate by email or telephone on that. Can I add something to that, Phil? Yes. Um, we also have a fairly wide range of uh, income in the families in our community, and uh, I think there's even an article in Cooperative Grocer that points out that using um, uh, member worker or member labor doesn't necessarily save the co-op any money, so it's maybe kind of a false economy for the co-op itself. But in terms of trying to be uh, price conscious for the whole community, we uh, looked a lot at our competition, which 
in our case, the immediate competition in the neighborhoods that are would be the lowest income is going to be convenience stores, um, which is not necessarily how it is everywhere, but it's where how it is a lot of places. And we feel that we can be very uh, competitive in the kind of things that we're going to be also selling milk and cereal and some basic staples uh, against convenience stores. So right off the bat, we're at, we're bringing more uh, higher quality food at competitive pricing to some of the, the poor members of our community. Um, and in addition to that, we're hoping to be able to have special pricing on various, uh, you know, staple items so that we don't have the perception or the reality of being uh, a store that's much higher priced. Now, of course, that we'll have to see how it all shakes out when the store is actually up and running. But those are some ways we're trying to address the perception that we're going to be expensive, that some neighborhoods are going to feel excluded because of that. Um, that's just what we're, how we're approaching it. Okay. Thank you. That's good. Um, Stuart, any additional? I have a couple more if you'd like to keep going. Um, Durham Central Market says they're in stage 2A and selling shares for $100. New businesses, or now businesses and organizations also want to sign on, and they have resisted selling them $100 owner shares, but would like to offer a different investment arrangement and are considering uh, a preferred shares at $1,000 with no shopping discount privilege. What do you think of that kind of an arrangement? Um, I think preferred shares are, are a possible source of, of capital. Um, and that that you know figuring out the relationship to voting shares and would preferred shareholders also have a voting share you know there's there are just a number of legal issues, but I think it's something to to look at and and consider uh you know what are the what are the benefits to the preferred shareholders are there different categories of preferred shareholders um there are a lot of legal questions there that I don't have uh, a very good answer for uh, Joel Dahlgren who I believe is doing one of the uh, one of the webinars upcoming is uh, is an attorney who's worked with a lot of uh, co-ops prim primarily as a specialty including a lot of startup co-ops so I think he would be could give even a better answer to that that's correct he is doing and an, uh upcoming webinar on legal issues that I would highly recommend for people to attend. Do you have the date on that, Stuart? Um, I can get it for you here in a second. But in and the Joel, Joel has also authored the legal primer that's now available on the Food Club 500 website in terms of advice on legal issues related to incorporation uh, primarily. Joel's webinar is on September 24th. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Do uh, you want one more question? Yes. Okay. Uh, what is the advantage of securing a site before you have all of your financing in place? Doesn't that heighten risk even with real estate contingencies? Well, uh, the advantage of securing a site before you have all your financing in place is that that in order to get all your financing in place, you have to do fairly extensive design work. Uh, typically with an architect, a store planner, and there's significant cost there. And if you go and do that design work without having a site secured, you run a strong risk of maybe not having that site, not not being able to secure that site or losing that site. And so the idea is this two-step process to secure the site so it's within the control of the co-op, but there are contingencies. In other words, the co-op can still get out of the deal. And uh, and then once you also secure the site, at that point, I believe, if, if it's agreeable with the property owner, then you can uh, publicly announce that. And that gives you the, the opportunity then to uh, gain more members and to you know gain more member loans as well. I, I don't know if I missed a component of that question or not, Stuart. But thank you. I think you got it. Um, yeah, uh, the 
my experience working with a lot of startup groups is that having that site and being able to announce it publicly is a, can make a big difference in the fundraising efforts. Yeah. So I would like to uh, go back to uh, Amanda and Ben here and, and ask them a little bit if they were, and maybe I'll ask Ben first, but um, what, is, what are the two most kind of critical issues your group is looking at at this point? And how are you working to address them? And uh, I'll ask the same of Amanda. Um, well, at this moment, um, we're probably our our the amount of work that we have to do has increased a lot, and we haven't kept pace with increasing the amount of talent in the organization. So we're all feeling a little bit overwhelmed at the moment. Uh, so that's a big challenge uh, of you know, how do we keep up everything that we've got going on, plus get more people involved, get them up to speed, get them functional. Um, and you, you, had, you had hired somebody to do some assistance in membership development, I believe. Yes, we hired someone, uh, I think, about a year ago now, and that worked out really well. We're in the process of putting together the uh, GM requirements and job description so we can begin to advertise for that person, and we're kind of hoping, maybe foolishly, that that person can also serve as a project manager uh, for, you know, for the project. Um, but in addition to that, we're also, like I said, finishing the, the uh, business plan, finishing the member loan drive paperwork, um, trying to keep a lot of things going, trying to do uh, every other week, do some kind of small we'll call it a micro events, uh, and it takes a lot of people to keep all of these things going and make sure that there's people at these events and the leafleting and uh, all that kind of stuff. So at the moment, that's really our, I mean, as soon as we can get through this period of getting all of our paperwork together, then I guess the next big challenge facing us is going to be the financing in earnest. Uh, we've just started that process, but of really going to the banks and, and going to the people and trying to generate the the money, and it's a lot of money. So uh, that will be that's looming in the very near future. Yeah. Okay. Um, Amanda, would you like to comment? Uh, sure. I think the uh, the two biggest issues for us right now are. Um, Dealing with our membership and letting them know what's happened in terms of losing our site and then, you know, figuring out how to go forward and not lose momentum and find a new site, um, that's a huge issue right now. And then also um, financing is the other thing because we've realized in working on our uh, performance that what we had initially thought would be um, loan financing is in order for us to, you know, be a, a co-op that works, um, we, we're going to need that to be, uh, you know, grant money and that kind of thing. So we do have a fundraising committee, and they've started uh, writing grants and trying to figure out how we're going to get that money. Um, and in terms of the, the membership and losing the site, we made an announcement and we planned a meeting, a special meeting, but we had to evacuate here last week. So our, our special meeting actually was canceled, and now we're having to postpone that. But it's been difficult this summer because people didn't want to go public about what was happening until we really knew what was happening, but it kind of kept us from being able to do the work that we need to do to go forward without, like, how do you go to your membership and say, we need to form a site search committee, and, and then they're going to say, what do you mean? I thought we had a site. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so that hopefully will be, you know, dealt with by the end of the month because we're having to reschedule that meeting um, because we had to cancel it last week. Right. Certainly your group has been a resilient group. Uh, as you're, I think the group initially organized prior to K Katrina. And yeah. It's your, and then you've had this great um, 
you know, growth in your membership base this year. Uh, so I really <coughs> applaud the progress you've made. <coughs> With uh, speaking of uh, grants, and <coughs> it's it's always dangerous to be, you know, reliant upon that and uh, for any type of, you know, in these startup projects, and there aren't any, um, you know, the the sources for grant incomes or grant funding is certainly very limited. Um, perhaps in your community there are some special circumstances that might uh, allow for this, but I, I just wanted to throw that out in terms of uh, it's in, typically in most of the startup co-ops, the grants or donations are not a large part of the of the source of the funds needed to start up. I think New Orleans really is unusual right now because there is a lot of money available for economic development, especially in uh, underserved areas. Um, you know, there's very few grocery stores here in the city, so uh, there's more of an interest in bringing that back. Hopefully that will work in our favor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Stuart, do you have another question? Uh, yeah. Um, let's see. How about this one? I have um, with, um, in the organi organizing sta stage, you determine what the membership fee will be, and you actually ask the community to assist in helping you continue to the next stage. Is that correct? Uh, yes, it is. I mean, I think you you want to be educating your members and potential members that of of the of the steps and the process that you're going to take and that you're not going to be, you know, typically you're not going to be open if you're not going to be going on and recruiting members one month and opening the store the next month. And so to educate your members about the process that's involved and the risk that is involved uh, and the timeline uh, is important. And certainly member support, uh, demonstrated member support in a variety of avenues, either the to member equity or support at um, community events or being able to go out and spread positive word about the co-op and help recruit new members. These are all things that, that members can and should be asked to do, uh, you know, to be involved in bringing the co-op into having a, you know, a retail grocery store. Um, are you aware of any co-ops that have a local currency as part of their program? And should that be part of the vision of the co-op, or would you recommend doing it as a separate kind of later project? I would recommend it as a separate later project. Uh, I mean, I know some communities that have uh, alternate currency, but I don't uh, know of any food co-ops that have that have done anything significant um, with that. Um, Sometimes there are, are you know prepayments for food that you would buy at a at a later date. Uh, some of those type of things can be just, you know researched and planned and, and possibly implemented. And some co-ops have done that, but I don't know of a lot of uh, real real great successes with that. Uh, but it you know it, it's it's a plan that could work. Uh, there might, you know, as with member loans and so on, there might be some securities issues involved with that. There's a follow-up on the question of um, bringing money in from owners early on. Where would the remaining capital come from? Loans? And how do most co-ops receive the bulk of their financing? This is a chance for you to plug your next webinar here, Bill. Yes. Uh, I'll be doing another webinar. Um, I think it's in <laughs> October here on uh, October 15th, where we'll get into much more detail. We'll work through, look at a what I refer to as a sources and uses budget, show how a sources and uses budget flows through the life of a the startup phase of a project, and uh, so we'll be able to get a much greater sense of this at that time. Uh, typically, though, I would say that you would be looking to raise uh, the owners of the co-op will need to provide 
somewhere between 30 and 60 percent of the startup capital that is needed, um, and that total costs, startup costs prior to opening can range from 200 to 250 dollars per square foot. Maybe they can be lower. I bet they could be higher. And uh, so, calculating that out, if you're looking at uh, having a store of uh, 6,000 6, square feet, the total development cost of $250 a square foot, so a $1.5 million project, and let's say 50% of that needs to be raised in the form of member equity, member loans, or you know, donations and grants would be you know, $750,000. Um, that number could be a little bit lower, but uh, it, it, that's the typical range. Sorry about the typing there. Um, did you want to take another question, or do you need to move on to your presentation? I think we'll. I think we can come back to the to the presentation here and begin to wrap up, and maybe hear a final word from um, Amanda and Ben here in just a moment. Uh, if they're still able to be with us. Um, the c coming back and looking at commitment again testing your commitment level of your group, and this is something I think you should look at, uh, both as individuals working on the project and then your group as a whole, and to have some discussions about this and say, you know, yes, I'm interested in working on this project. I'm committed, but I don't have, this is the type of time I can I can commit, and um, I might, for example, I might have more time in two months, but this month I'm really busy. and everybody being clear on what, what they're able to, to commit time-wise. And, uh, and then as a group, you know, do you have enough talent? Uh, do you have enough people, skilled people who can work together and, and do the work that is needed to bring about your co-op grocery store? Uh, how much money will be needed and where will that money come from? And certainly the leadership group will not every person in that leadership group, but they will all be members, and um, hopefully, you know, member loans of a significant amount can be also be raised from what I'm calling the core group or the steering committee or the founding team. And 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 again, I would emphasize not every member of that group should be expected to make a member loan, certainly. Um, but you will the 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 steering committee will be looked at in saying if they're if they're willing to put their money at risk that sends a good message to the rest of the members um, so so looking at time um, looking at it taking a one and a half to three plus years to bring about a project um, you know the core leadership group will need to meet uh, weekly during weekly to monthly during the project. Leaders can expect to put in five to twenty hours a week at many stages of the project. Uh, we can ask Dan and Amanda to comment on that in just a moment. Um, we looked at this slide here a little bit in terms of how much money it might cost. Um, looking at risk. It's important early on to to acknowledge the level of risk as a as a key component. Uh, having open discussion and dialogue about this with your group, uh, expressing the fears and looking at worst case scenarios, um, and recognizing that this whole development process that your group is going through can be viewed as a healthy test. You know, can your organization clear these hurdles and barriers it will encounter? If so. You know you're much better positioned for success. And if, of course, if you can't clear those hurdles, you will not be positioned for success. Um, but the board needs to determine when the money raised through member equity is put at risk uh, to cover some of the development costs, and that that should be clearly communicated to the members. So depending on the financial resources, uh, this can be at the end of stage one or at the end of stage two, or it may be allocated in segments. 
similarly with member loans, typically you would raise the member loans and not use those member loans until you have definitely uh, moved past your final decision point, you know, closed in all your financing. So you, you protect those member loans. Um, so Ben, um, can you comment a little bit on time uh, involvement that you and your group have experienced? And then Amanda, I'll ask the same of you. Um, yeah, your your timeline seems seems accurate. We'll end up taking, I think, all of three years, and then maybe a little more, um, depending on how you want to pick our starting point. Um, and it is a lot of work, uh, but I want to also make sure. I mean, I'm at a place in the in, in our co-op, and also our co-op is in a place in our development that right now is a really heavy-duty time for uh, volunteer involvement, but uh, I don't want to sound too negative because it is also a lot of fun, um, and it's incredibly exciting to think about this store that we're creating. So uh, there are a lot of rewards for all this time and, and the stress, too. Um, but, yeah, having a good, solid core group of people who uh, can work together well and um, I mean, although we need more people to do day-to-day -day work, we have a good group that supports each other and that we can speak to each other frankly and that helps a lot. We're not expending effort on, you know, internal uh, conflicts. We're putting all of our effort into dealing with getting the co-op started. Right. Thank you. And Amanda, uh, about a minute for you here. <laughs> uh, sure. Um... It does uh, take a significant amount of time. We're lucky to have some unemployed people, some freelance people, some very talented retired people all uh, involved in our board and our steering committee, which we call the action team. Um, and uh, depending on what's going on, you know, sometimes you, you spend maybe just I guess the minimum I spend is like an hour a day, but sometimes when something is happening, it will be more than that. Um, we have our work split up into subcommittees of our action team, which has been really helpful because we have communications media people, and that's what they do, and we have finance people, and that's what they do. Um, so our, our division of labor has worked really well for us. Um, and, and we think that if we find a new site soon uh, that we're still on track to open with roughly the same timeline that we had when we had a site uh, that we thought we were definitely going to be in, which would be to open in the beginning of uh, 2010. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, Thanks, Amanda and Ben, for being with us here today. Uh, Mark, could you tell people how they might uh, download the slides? Yes, I will. Uh, and thank you, uh, Bill, Amanda, and Ben and Stuart. Um, the slides are available as a PDF file on the original um, page that you see all of the um, sessions listed. And um, I'll be posting the recording there also later today or, or uh, tonight or tomorrow morning. So that is a good page to go back to. Uh, we'll be building up uh, all the resources right on that page as we go through the 12 sessions. And um, we hope that you come back next week for the session that Stuart will be leading, uh, Skills and Tools for the Organizing Stage, same time, same station. Uh, you do need to be registered in order to get access to the the flow of information that you need to connect. And then lastly, there is a session evaluation that will be coming on your screen just about a minute after we end the session. It takes a minute for the system to load it up for you, and we do appreciate your um, completing that. So thanks very much, Bill. Thank you, uh, Mark. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks, uh, Amanda. And thanks, Ben. And thanks. All. Please note that your conference will expire in 10 minutes. Thanks. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for her too. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll be talking to a lot. Of